Thank you for joining us today. My name is Kathy Sheffers and I'm with Goodhart Wilcox Publisher. Goodhart Wilcox is really proud to support HVAC educators with quality instructional resources designed to help prepare your students for entry-level HVAC careers. Today, I'm happy to introduce you to one of our outstanding authors. Terry Xavier wrote Math for HVACR, which provides a review of basic math and advanced calculations within a framework of HVAC applications. In the book, Gary has done a wonderful job explaining why HVAC technici technicians need to know the material. Gary was also instrumental in the development of GW's new Follow the Heat animations, which are available with the 21st edition of Modern Refrigeration and Air Conditioning and the new 5th edition of Heating and Cooling Essentials by Don Crawshaw. During his presentation today, Gary will share more details about the Follow the Heat animations and provide you with some teaching strategies based on his follow the heat instruction he has used successfully with his own students. So now I will turn it over to Gary Xavier. Thanks, Kathy. Hi, everyone. As Kathy said, I'm Gary Xavier. You've probably already figured that out. But good morning or good afternoon, whichever the case may be. And as Kathy said, we're going to talk about follow the heat. I've been using the follow the heat process of instruction for about 20 years, and it works well for me. Some of you may have seen it in the past, and if so, I hope it's working well for you also. So let's get right into it here. When we talk about follow the heat, of course, don't forget, we're in the heat transfer business. So welcome to the heat transfer business. It's what we do. We move heat around. That's been my job for over 50 years. I've moved heat in and out of places, but it never stays put. If I move it out, it comes back in. If I move it in, it goes back out. For us in the HVACR business, that's job security. That's what we do. We transfer heat. So when I talk about heat transfer, when we talk about following the heat, that came from the idea of how do we, under, how do we get students to understand that refrigeration cycle. Heating's pretty simple by comparison, but refrigeration is not. And the refrigeration cycle can be very confusing, but if we start where the heat starts, if we start at the evaporator, we can make that work for us. So when we're in the heat transfer business, we're always moving heat around. We transfer heat from a place where we have it to a place where we want it when we do heating, but when we do cooling, we take the heat from a place we don't want it and send it somewhere we don't care about, a place that makes little or no difference to us. So it's always heat transfer. Everything we do is heat transfer. If we think of something as simple as a window air conditioner or a split system or a rooftop unit, there's only two steps in the heat transfer process. The heat goes from the conditioned space to the refrigerant. That happens at your evaporator. And then we take the refrigerant from the evaporator, carrying the heat from the conditioned space, pull it into the compressor, squeeze it, and send it out to the condenser. And from the condenser, it goes out to the outside air. So it's only a two-step process with a window air conditioner, a rooftop unit, a split system, anything that's air to refrigerant or refrigerant to air heat transfer, there's just two steps in that process. But if we use water as a medium, then it becomes three steps or four. With a water-cooled system with a DX evaporator, it's three steps. The heat goes from the conditioned space to the refrigerant at the evaporator, from the refrigerant to the condenser water at the condenser, and then from the condenser water to the outside air. And we can send that condenser water down the drain, what we call a wastewater system, or we can send it to a cooling tower or a spray pond. We can send that heat to a place that makes little or no difference. With a chiller, it's either three steps or four steps. With an air-cooled chiller, it's three steps. The heat goes from the conditioned space to the chilled water, from the chilled water to the refrigerant, and then from the refrigerant to the outside air. But if it's a water-cooled chiller, it becomes four steps. The heat goes from the conditioned space to the chilled water, from the chilled water to the refrigerant at the chiller's evaporator, from the refrigerant to the condenser water at the chiller's condenser, and then from the condenser water to the outside air. So it can be two steps or three steps or four steps or more. I've seen systems that had five or six steps. 
because they added an extra heat transfer spot, an extra heat exchanger. But no matter how many steps it is, it's just heat transfer. Everything we do is heat transfer. Take a look at this little window air conditioner I've got right here. A very simple device. Now, this little window air conditioner, as everyone knows, sits in a window. And part of it is inside the room and part of it's outside. But if I take the case off of this, we've got an evaporator right here where the heat comes in from the conditioned space. And as that heat goes across that evaporator, as the air moves across that evaporator, the heat from the air, some of it anyway, gets transferred into the cooler refrigerant. So the heat goes from the air to the refrigerant. And then we pump that around through the compressor and out to the condenser. So the heat comes in here at the evaporator. We bring that refrigerant around through the compressor and out to the condenser where we send the heat out to the outside air. So it's heat in, pump it around and heat out. Just two steps, but it's all heat transfer. Everything we do is heat transfer. So it can be very simple, like this little window air conditioner, or it can be more complex, but it's always heat transfer. That's our business. That's what we do. So when I teach the refrigeration cycle, or when I teach heating as well, and talk about the sequence of operation for a burner, I always start with thermodynamics, and I do that on purpose. I call it review because it's things we already know. I always tell my students, you know this all, you learned it growing up, but we have to refresh our memory with it. So thermodynamics is a very, very important foundation for our business. It starts with matter. And matter is defined as anything that occupies space and has weight. And in this bottle of water, you can see the liquid perhaps. I've got water, they fill these things pretty full, but I've got a little bit of air in there. But this is liquid water. I could turn it into solid ice by taking some heat out, or I could turn it into vapor steam by adding some heat. So what makes the difference between the solid ice, the liquid water, or the vapor steam is the amount of heat in the material. And we're in the heat transfer business, it's what we do. So it starts with matter. The amount of heat in the material determines the state or phase of the matter. When we talk about heat, there's five forms of energy that we deal with, and heat is one of them. There are five forms of energy, chemical energy, mechanical energy, electrical energy, light energy, and thermal energy or heat. Let's take a look at a little animation on that. Five forms of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. There are five forms of energy that nature gives us to work with, chemical, thermal, mechanical, electrical, and light. We can't create energy and we can't destroy energy. We can change the form of energy and move it around, but we can't create it or destroy it. We call that the first law of thermodynamics. When we take natural gas from the ground, or coal or oil, or we take wood off the land or trash, which we call biomass, and burn these things, we call them fuel. But they are all carbon and hydrogen, chemical energy. When we burn a fuel, we might think we have created heat, but we simply converted chemical energy to thermal energy. If we use that heat to run a steam boiler and turn water into steam, and use that steam to spin a turbine, what have we done? We've changed thermal energy into mechanical energy, the spinning of the turbine. If the spinning turbine turns a generator to make electricity, we've now turned mechanical energy into electrical energy. And if the electricity is used to light our lights, we've gone full circle. Chemical, thermal, mechanical, electrical, and light. But those lights aren't 100% efficient. They give off some heat. Electric motors give off heat. Computers give off heat. So we just go around in a big circle. That's nature's rule. It's called the first law of energy conservation. 
also known as the first law of thermodynamics. It's very strict, but very simple. We can't create energy and we can't destroy energy. All of the energy on our planet provided by the sun has always been here and will always be here. We can change the form of energy and move it around, but we can't create it and we can't destroy it. I like to say we can't make it or break it. We can simply change it and move it. We call it the first law of thermodynamics. Five forms of energy, the first law of thermodynamics. What we just saw in the video was the first law of thermodynamics, of course. Heat can be, cannot be created nor destroyed. Heat cannot be created nor destroyed. It can simply be changed in form and moved around. We call it the first law. But the second law is one we use even more often in our trade than the first law. The second law says heat always goes from a warmer place to a cooler place. If we want to take the heat out of this room, for example, and I want to keep this room at 70 degrees, if it's 40 degrees outside, I can open a window and let some heat out. But if it's 90 degrees outside, if I open a window, I'll be letting heat in because heat always goes from a warmer place to a cooler place. But we know that. We know if we take a cup of coffee and set it on the table and don't drink it, it gets cool. Or if we take a glass of water and set it on the table and don't drink it, it gets warm because the heat's always moving. And until the two materials are the same temperature, the heat will continue to move. So heat always goes from a warmer place to a cooler place. We learn these things growing up. We learn these things as children, but we don't always know exactly why they do that. But that is the second law. So the first law of thermodynamics says we can change the form of energy and move it around, but we can't create it or destroy it. And the second law says heat always moves in the same direction. It moves from a warmer place to a cooler place. These are things we learn growing up. It's all part of our foundation. We also learn this. We learn about heat and temperature. I think I learned it wrong when I was a kid because I thought they were the same thing. For a long time, I thought heat and temperature were the same thing, but they're not. They're related, of course, but they're not the same thing. Heat's a quantity. Heat is a quantity of energy in the material and temperature is a measurement of that heat's intensity. So we measure them different ways because they're different things. If I say, for example, it's 70 degrees in this room, I didn't say how much heat was in here. I just said the measurement of the heat's intensity is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. If I wanna know how many BTUs are in here, British thermal units, then I've gotta calculate them. So the number of BTUs in here will determine the temperature, but they're not the same thing. We measure them differently because they are different. When we measure temperature, we measure in degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius usually. We can also use the scientific scales of Kelvin or Rankin, the absolute scales. But when we look at this thermometer, we know that water boils at sea level at standard atmospheric pressure, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit and freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But take a look at the bottom of this thermometer where it says absolute zero. Absolute zero is the point where there's no molecular motion. All the molecules stop moving. And to us in the heat transfer business, that means there's no more heat. There's no more heat. So conversely, that means there's heat all the way down to absolute zero. Now that's pretty cold, approximately negative 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit, but you don't need to remember the numbers. Just remember this, there's heat all the way down to absolute zero, and that's the premise of a heat pump. A heat pump works because it can move heat. That's all it does. I often think of a heat pump as an air conditioner that reverses where an air conditioner takes heat out, a heat pump brings heat in. It's just an air conditioner running backwards, so to speak. So instead of taking heat out of the building, 
it gets heat from outside and brings it in. We get heat out of the air or the ground or the groundwater. But a heat pump can work because Mother Nature says there's heat all the way down to absolute zero. That's what I think about when I think about temperature. But that's a measurement of the heat's intensity. That's not the quantity of heat. If you want to talk about the quantity of heat, then we need to talk in BTUs or kilojoules. The BTU, the British Thermal Unit, is our unit of heat energy, and we use it to tell us how much heat is in the material. And the BTU is based on one pound of water. If we take one pound of water and add a BTU to it, the temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit. And if we take a BTU out, the temperature goes down by one degree Fahrenheit. So let's start with the one pound of water. What's it look like? Well, it just so happens I have one right here. It says right on the front, one pound. Of, no, it doesn't. It says 500 milliliters or 16.9 fluid ounces or 1.05 pints. Even the bottle people have given up and gone metric. But this is a 500 milliliter bottle, which means it's almost exactly one pound. We know that a gallon of pure water weighs 8.34 pounds, and there's eight pints to a gallon. So a pint and a pound are very, very close. This is 16.9 fluid ounces, 1.05 pints. This is exactly one pound of water in this bottle. And I know that for a fact because I calculate it, but I also weighed it. I put it on my scale and weighed it. It weighs just a pound. So the bottle, by the way, weighs about a tenth of an ounce empty. So that is one pound of water. And if I add one BTU of heat to it, its temperature goes up by one degree Fahrenheit. And if I take a BTU out, its temperature goes down by one degree Fahrenheit. So what would that look like? What would a BTU look like? It would look like the heat that comes out of a match. If I struck a match and let it burn all the way down to my fingers, that would be just about one BTU. That's what it would take to raise the temperature of that one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. That's the BTU. We're about the only ones in the world that still use the BTU. Even the British gave up and went metric about 15 years ago. Everyone else now typically uses the kilojoule. For a while, we used calories in other parts of the world. We didn't use it much in the United States, but calories were used. Kilojoules seem to have replaced that mainly now. There's the conversions that you can see as they relate to the BTU, the calorie, and the kilojoule. But the KJ is pretty common now everywhere except the United States. So as you see information on units that come from other parts of the world, what you might find is you might find that you need to convert from calories or kilojoules to BTUs. These are the conversion factors, and you can find those in a book that I'm very, very fond of. It's called Math for HVACR. You heard Kathy mention it before, and I am fond of it because I wrote it. I wrote it because I found in teaching HVACR. So many of the math fundamentals were not understood by my students. So I decided with the help of Goodhart Wilcox, a very big amount of help from Goodhart Wilcox, to put that into a math book. And so that's where the conversion factors come from. So we convert all sorts of things. And oftentimes we convert our BTUs per hour into tons. As AC guys, we often talk about a 10 ton unit or a 20 ton unit or a 10,000 ton chiller. Well, what is a ton of refrigeration? A ton of refrigeration is 2,000 pounds of 32 degree ice melting, <coughs> pardon me, 2,000 pounds of 32 degree ice melting in 24 hours. That's one ton of refrigeration. Now, to make that happen, the ice has got to be ready to melt. It has to be at its saturation point. So it has to be at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. In order to get that ice to melt, it would have to absorb 288,000 BTUs of heat energy from the air around it. If you divide 288,000 by 24, it comes out to 12,000 BTUs per hour. So there's the conversion, one ton 
is 12,000 BTUs per hour. So a three ton unit is 36,000 BTUs per hour. A 10 ton unit is 120,000 BTUs per hour. So we can call it by tons or we can call it by BTUs per hour. We generally use tons for the larger equipment simply because it's a it's an easier number to deal with. For cooling towers, there is a different conversion for cooling towers. It's 15,000 BTUs per hour makes one ton on a cooling tower. And the reason for that difference is probably obvious. It's because of the rate of evaporation of water through the cooling tower. As the water evaporates, it transfers more heat. So we get our best heat transfer by the change of state, which we're gonna talk about in just a few minutes. But the cooling tower ton is 15,000 BTUs per hour, where the chiller itself is 12,000 BTUs per hour equals one ton. That's another conversion that we often use. Specific heat is defined as the number of BTUs required to change the temperature of one pound of a substance by one degree Fahrenheit. That sounds very, very familiar to us because we just defined a BTU as being the amount of heat energy necessary to change one pound of pure water by one degree Fahrenheit. They are very closely related and water is the baseline, so to speak, for specific heat. So when we look at specific heat, what we see is we have different materials have different numbers for specific heat. It changes also with temperature. But what we find is this, that the specific heat of water is one, which means that one BTU changes the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Ice, for example, has a specific heat number of 0.487 at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. We can round that off to 0.5. What that would mean is that if I add a half of a BTU to a pound of ice, the temperature goes up by one degree. Think about that for a moment. If a half of a BTU raises the temperature of the ice by one degree, a whole BTU will raise the temperature of the ice by two degrees. So water and ice are the same material, but they don't transfer heat at the same rate. Water, one BTU, raises the temperature by one degree. Ice, one BTU, raises the temperature of a pound of ice by two degrees. What about steam? We use steam a lot for heat transfer in larger systems, and steam has a specific heat number of 0.489 at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. These numbers all change slightly with temperature, not much, but a little bit. But steam, 0.489, we can round that off to 0.5 as well. So that means a pound of steam absorbing one BTU will see an increase in temperature of two degrees. Water, ice, and steam are all the same material. They're all H2O, but they transfer heat at different rates because they're in different states. Liquids transfer heat better than anything else. The higher the number, the better the heat transfer. So water is better than ice, water is better than steam for transferring heat. Liquid is better than solid, liquid is better than vapor. When we think about that, we should think about a refrigeration system. An air conditioning or refrigeration system uses a refrigerant. R22, R12, R134A, R410A, whatever it happens to be. That refrigerant is both liquid and vapor in our system. Liquid changing the vapor in the evaporator and vapor changing the liquid in the condenser. But when they are in liquid state, they do a better job of heat transfer than when they're in vapor state. Look at the numbers. The higher the number, the better the heat transfer. Liquid is better than vapor for heat transfer. That's what we want to remember from this. We don't need to remember the numbers. We won't use them for anything. If we were designing refrigeration equipment, we would. If we were system designers, designing a, a piece of refrigeration equipment to cool chocolate as it's made or to, to cool milk or any of these things, then we would have to calculate in the specific heat of the product we want to cool but we're not doing design here. So we don't have to remember the numbers. 
just remember that liquid is better than vapor for heat transfer. That's what you want to remember. But the best heat transfer we get is during the change of state from liquid to vapor or vapor to liquid. So liquid is better than vapor. It always has been, it always will be. That's what we want to remember about specific heat. There are two kinds of heat that we always talk about in our trade. Sensible heat and latent heat. Sensible heat causes a change in temperature, where latent heat causes a change of state. If you look up the word latent in the dictionary, it's defined as hidden from plain sight. Hidden from plain sight. We call the change of state heat latent because it's hidden from our thermometer. During a change of state, there's no change in temperature. It's one or the other. We can't do both at the same time. Mother Nature won't let us. And what we're going to see right now is that the change of state heat, the latent heat, does more work for us than the sensible heat. Let's take that one pound of water. I love my one pound of water. I have it with me all the time. Well, let's take that one pound of water and have it at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and then take it down to zero degrees Fahrenheit. So we're going to freeze it. We're going to freeze it. We're going to turn it into ice. And I'm going to start out with one pound of ice at zero degrees Fahrenheit. I'll be at the little number one in the circle in the bottom left corner of this graph where my ice is at zero degrees Fahrenheit and zero BTUs of added heat energy. So on this graph, what we see is on the vertical axis, we have temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. On the horizontal axis, the x-axis, we have heat energy in BTUs, that's added heat. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this, this one pound of ice at zero degrees Fahrenheit and just leave it sitting here. Now it's about 70 degrees in this room. So we know what's gonna to happen to the ice. It's gonna melt eventually, but the ice is not ready to melt at zero degrees Fahrenheit. It won't melt at zero degrees Fahrenheit. It has to warm up to 32 degrees Fahrenheit so that it's ready to melt. So the first thing that's gonna happen is that one pound of ice is going to absorb heat from the air around it. And as it absorbs heat from the 70 degree air, the ice will start to warm up. It's going to take 16 BTUs approximately to warm that ice from zero degrees Fahrenheit to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. How do I know it's going to take 16 BTUs? The specific heat of ice is approximately 0.5. So for every BTU I absorb, the temperature goes up two degrees per pound. So if I absorb 16 BTUs, the temperature will go from zero to 32. We know, of course, in real life, it's not going to happen just like that. And it's not going to happen evenly. The outside edges are going to warm up first and start to melt. And the center is going to stay frozen for a while. But we have to think theory here. So in theory, the ice is not going to melt until the entire block has warmed up to 32 degrees. And that's going to take 16 BTUs. Now, once we hit 32 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, standard atmospheric pressure, the ice is now ready to melt. It's ready to change state. It's ready to thaw. There's a lot of things we can call it. But I'm going to say the ice is saturated. It's saturated. Saturation to us means ready to change state. When we are saturated or at our saturation temperature, we are ready to change state. But if you look up the word saturated in the dictionary, it doesn't say that. It defines saturated as full. Saturated means full. So think of it as the ice is full of heat. If you give it any more, it's going to turn into something else. And what's the ice going to turn into? Water. So once we hit saturation, now the heat that we absorb will change the state of the material and not change the temperature. So the heat that warmed the ice up from zero to 32 is called sensible because we can see it on our thermometer. 
The heat that melts the ice is called latent or hidden because we can't see it on our thermometer. So what we have now is ice melting. And as that ice absorbs heat and melts, it's going to take 144 BTUs of latent heat absorbed from the air in the room to melt that ice. And that 32 degree Fahrenheit ice will turn into 32 degree water because during the change of state, there is no change in temperature. Mother Nature says it's one or the other. You can change the temperature or you can change the state, but you can't do both at the same time. Once we've absorbed that 144 BTUs of latent heat, all of the ice will be gone. I have a pan of 32 degree water because the heat was latent. And during the change of state, there's no change in temperature. But once that last little sliver of ice melts, the next BTU of heat that we absorb from the air around us will raise the temperature of that water by one degree Fahrenheit, because now it's back to water. It has a specific heat of one. So for every BTU I absorb now, the temperature will go up one degree per pound. Now, I want to get it up to 212. I want to boil it. And there's not enough heat in the air around me to bring the water up above 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to have to put a burner under my pan. And I'm going to light off my little burner. And I'm going to put 180 BTUs of heat energy from my fire into my water. And when I do, it'll take it up 180 degrees, which is the difference between 32 and 212. Now, once I hit 212 degrees Fahrenheit, actually 211.9, but we rounded off to 212. Once I hit 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level, standard atmospheric pressure, my water is now ready to boil. It's ready to change state. It's ready to vaporize. We can say a lot of different things about it, but I'm going to say it's saturated. At number two, the ice was full of heat. And if we gave it any more, it turned into something else. It turned into water. And at the little number four on your graph, the water is full of heat. If you give it any more, it's going to turn into something else. It's going to turn into steam. And that steam will be 212 degrees Fahrenheit, just like the water that made it. Because during a change of state, there's no change in temperature. It's one or the other. Mother Nature doesn't let us do both at the same time. As that water turns into steam, and the steam comes out of that pan, the steam will be 212 degrees. And if I give that pan of water 970 BTUs of heat energy out of my burner, my pan will be empty, and the room will be full of 212 degrees steam. Now, we know if we really did that right here in my room, It'd be pretty uncomfortable for me. I'd be in 212 degrees, I'd be scalded. I'd be in 212 degree steam. But we also know what would happen. We know that as the steam came up out of the pan and hit the walls and hit the ceiling, it would condense. And that condensate dripping off the ceiling would be 212 degree water because during a change of state, there's no change in temperature. So here's something to think about. We put 970 BTUs of heat energy from my fire into that pan of water to turn it into steam. But everything's 212 degrees. The water's 212, the steam is 212, and the condensate dripping back down on my bald head is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So if everything is 212 degrees, where did the 970 BTUs go? I put 970 BTUs of heat energy from my fire into the water. Where did it go? Everything's 212. It went into the ceiling, into the walls, into the air. Wherever the steam condensed, wherever the steam gave up its heat and turned back to water, that's where it left the heat. That's where it left the 970 BTUs. So we use the steam to carry the heat from the fire to the ceiling because we're in the heat transfer business.
And we often use steam as a medium. We use water as a medium. We use air as a medium. We use refrigerant as a medium to transfer heat. Uh, we get the best heat transfer we can get when we change the state of the medium. When we change that water from liquid to vapor and vapor back to liquid, we can transfer a tremendous amount of heat. And we do the same thing with our refrigerants and our air conditioning and refrigeration systems. We change the refrigerant from liquid to vapor through the evaporator and from vapor to liquid through the condenser. And the reason we do it is to transfer the maximum amount of heat. Latent heat does the work for us. I often like to say sensible heat is just along for the ride, but latent heat does the job. Latent heat, the change of state from liquid to vapor. Think about this. Think about this pan of water turning to steam right here in front of me. We have to imagine it, of course, but imagine that pan of water turning into steam as I add heat. And imagine the steam going up to the ceiling and condensing and dripping back down. But now imagine this, imagine this. Imagine that I could collect all the steam before it hit the ceiling and condensed and put it back in the pan and give it some more heat. Now we know physically I couldn't do that, but what if I could? I collect all the steam, put on my special steam mittens, not available in stores, put on my special steam mittens and put all that steam back in the pan and turn the burner back on. What would happen to that steam if I gave it more heat? Its temperature would go up. And we would call that superheated steam. Now, we use the term superheat in the air conditioning and refrigeration business all the time. We say our superheat's this, our superheat's that. We have evaporator superheat and compressor superheat and discharge superheat. Well, what does it mean? Superheat simply means heat added to a vapor that causes an increase in temperature. In the steam business, we have saturated steam and we have superheated steam. So we use the term superheat a lot, but it simply means this, heat added to a vapor that causes an increase in temperature. And we can measure that. So we use that difference between the temperature of the superheated vapor and the saturated vapor to tell us how much superheat we have. And we use that as a measuring tool a lot in the ACR business. So that's the definition of superheat. Superheat is simply heat added to a vapor that causes an increase in temperature. So from this graph, remember a couple of things. Number one is superheat, heat added to a vapor that causes an increase in temperature. Don't forget that the best way to transfer heat is not by changing the temperature. It's by changing the state. Latent heat does the most work for us. That's what we want to remember from this graph. Saturation, there's your definition. Think of it as full. The material is full of heat. It can't accept or reject anymore without changing state. And then superheat, there's the definition of superheat as well. There are three methods of heat transfer that we use on this planet. Mother Nature was very gracious in giving us different ways to transfer heat, conduction, convection, and radiation. Conduction is heat transfer from molecule to molecule. It's by direct contact. If this molecule has heat in it, it touches this molecule, the heat goes from this one to this one. It is the best method of heat transfer there is. It's also the first one you learn as a kid because you touch something hot, you burn your finger, and that is conduction. We use it all the time. But we also use convection. And convection comes from the word convey. It means to convey or to carry the heat. So we use a medium like air or water or refrigerant or steam to carry the heat. That's convection. But convection and conduction always work together. 
We can't separate them on this planet. As the air is moving through this room, that's convection. But as the air touches my body, that's conduction. So convection and conduction always work together. As your refrigerant goes through your piping, that's convection. But as it touches the inside of the coil, that's conduction. So convection and conduction always work together. And then we have radiational heat transfer. Radiation is how the sun heats the earth. The sun is hot, the earth is warm. Outer space in between is bitter cold. So if the sun is hot and the earth is warm, why is outer space cold? Because there's nothing to absorb the heat. Radiated heat is absorbed by solid objects. So our planet absorbs the heat and then radiates it into the atmosphere around us. That's why it's cooler when you go up in the mountains. That's why it's cold when you fly in an airplane at 30,000 feet. You're not in outer space. You're still in our atmosphere. You're still closer to the sun, but you're farther from our heat source, which to us is, the, is our planet. So the sun heats the earth and the earth heats our atmosphere. When we put piping in the floor and send hot water through it to heat a building, what do we call that type of system? We call it a radiant heat system because we heat the solid object with hot water. We heat the floor, the walls with hot water. And then the floor of the walls heat the air around it. So we call it a radiant heat system. But conduction, convection, and radiation all work together. They all work together. It's all heat transfer. We can't separate them on this planet. Pressure is defined as force per unit of area. If I push down on the table with one pound of force and I'm pushing over one square inch, that would be one pound per square inch, one PSI. We measure in pounds per square inch, typically in this country, other parts of the world may use the kilopascal, which is uh, uh, the metric equivalent, so to speak. But pressure changes with atmosphere and it changes with altitude. These are some conversion factors if we need to convert between PSI and KPA, for example. And once again, these conversion factors come out of my favorite book, the math for HVACR. I don't know why this keeps showing up in the slideshow. It just does. But that is where the conversion factors come from. So standard atmospheric pressure at sea level is just under 15 pounds per square inch. 14.7 is how we round it off. It's actually 14.696 on a standard day, 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 0% relative humidity is how that's calculated. But we call it 14.7 typically, but that changes with altitude. If you go out to the mile high city of Denver, Colorado, your atmospheric pressure on a standard day is about 12 pounds. We're at the coast, it's about 15 pounds, just under 15, 14.696. So it changes with altitude. It changes with elevation. But we generally ignore that. We usually ignore that because we deal in gauge pressure. Gauge pressure ignores the atmosphere. If I were to take a look at this set of gauges right here, these are connected now to nothing other than the air, nothing other than the atmosphere. And their dials read zero because we're ignoring the atmosphere. Gauge pressure ignores the atmosphere. If you want to include the atmosphere, we have to add it in. We call that absolute pressure. Gauge plus atmosphere equals absolute. Generally, we do our work in PSIG, but we often do calculations in PSIA. So if we're calculating things, we may have to add in our atmospheric pressure. It changes with elevation, as we've already discussed. It changes at a rate of about a half a pound per thousand feet of elevation. So under a thousand feet, we call it 14.7. If we go up to a thousand feet, 14.2, thousand feet, 13.2. So we knock off a half a pound for every thousand feet is how we do that. So that is for calculation purposes.
When we deal with pressure, of course, we're dealing with atmospheric pressure or above. When we deal with vacuum, we're dealing below atmospheric pressure. Vacuum is defined as the absence of atmosphere. And we measure that a little differently. Now we could measure in negative PSI, but we normally do not. We measure in inches of mercury or microns. When we measure in inches of mercury, a perfect vacuum, the vacuum of outer space, is 29.92 inches of mercury vacuum. If we measure in microns, which is a thousandth of a millimeter, a perfect vacuum is zero, zero microns. The inches of mercury scale starts at atmospheric pressure and works its way down to a perfect vacuum. The micron scale starts at a perfect vacuum and works its way up to atmospheric pressure. So they work in opposite directions, but they mean the same thing. They mean the same thing to us. A micron is a thousandth of a millimeter, which is a much more accurate unit of measurement than an inch of mercury. One inch of mercury has approximately 25,400 microns. So one micron is about one twenty-five thousandth of an inch. So it's a very, very accurate unit of measurement. We use both in our trade. We use inches of mercury for vacuum where accuracy is not terribly important, but we use microns when accuracy is terribly important. The other terms shown here, the tor, the millibar, the bar, we don't use those much. We do use them on occasion. A tor is a thousand microns, named for the Italian physicist Torricelli. He was the inventor of the mercury barometer about 500 years ago, and the tor is named in his honor. The millibar and the bar, the, the weather people use those a lot. The meteorologists use those. They're always talking about bars and millibars of atmospheric pressure. But we don't use that too much in our trade once in a while. So these are the ways that we measure pressure and or vacuum. If we compare them, it looks like this. An atmospheric pressure at sea level, where water boils at approximately 212 degrees Fahrenheit, my PSIG would be zero. My gauge reading would be zero because my gauges ignore the atmosphere. PSIA would be gauge plus atmosphere and at standard atmospheric pressure of 14.696. My PSIA would be zero plus 14.696. Microns would be 760,000 microns at atmospheric pressure because the micron scale starts at a perfect vacuum and works its way up. And my inches of mercury vacuum would be zero because the inches of mercury vacuum scale starts at atmospheric pressure and works its way down to a perfect vacuum. So four different ways that we can measure pressure and or vacuum at atmosphere. But when we use that in the field, as we pull into a vacuum, we only use two of these. We normally don't use negative PSI, and we don't use PSIG and PSIA for that reason. So as I pull into a vacuum, I'm going to ignore the PSIG and the PSIA scale, and I'm gonna concentrate on microns and inches of mercury vacuum. And as I pull into that vacuum, my inches of mercury number increases. And if I went all the way to a perfect vacuum, the vacuum of outer space, my inches of mercury reading would be 29.92. But if I was reading microns as I pulled the same vacuum, when I got to that perfect vacuum, my micron reading would be zero. They run in opposite directions for the same vacuum. What we need to know about pulling a vacuum, as we call it, is this. When we pull a vacuum, to get the refrigerant out of a system, the government says, the EPA says, we have to pull a vacuum to four inches of mercury vacuum or 10 inches of mercury vacuum or 15 inches of mercury vacuum, whatever it happens to be. We use inches of mercury vacuum for that measurement because accuracy is not critical. We have to at least achieve four inches, 10 inches, 15 inches, whatever it is, but we don't have to be right at that. We just have to exceed it meet or exceed it. So accuracy is not terribly important. But 
when we pull a vacuum to get the air and moisture out of a system, accuracy is very important. So then we go to microns. Our desired level of evacuation on the micron scale is 250 to 500 microns. The reason for that is the saturation point of water at that vacuum level. The saturation point of water, the boiling point, changes with atmospheric pressure or with vacuum. As we increase the pressure in a boiler, the boiling point goes up. As we decrease, decrease the pressure when we pull a vacuum, the boiling point goes down. Water only boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level standard atmospheric pressure. Increase the pressure, the boiling point goes up. Decrease the pressure, the boiling point goes down. So if I pull down to 500 microns, my water boils at 12 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, where we might think it would be frozen solid, it's actually boiling. What we have to remember is that boiling does not mean hot. We grow up thinking boiling means hot, it does not. It means changing state from a liquid to a vapor. And it's based on a pressure temperature relationship. So instead of calling it boiling, we should probably call it saturation. But oftentimes we don't. We simply say, well, the water's boiling. It's at saturation. If I pull down to 250 microns of vacuum, my water is saturated at negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. 25 degrees below zero Fahrenheit and the water's boiling, it's changing state from a liquid to a vapor. And that's how we get the moisture out of the oil of our refrigeration system. That's what makes this important, is that when we pull a vacuum, the purpose is to get the moisture out of the oil of that compressor. And the only way we can get it out is to boil it out. So by pulling the deep vacuum, we can use the heat of the air around that piece of equipment to boil the water out of the oil. Think of it like this. Let's say that we need to change out a compressor. We've got a burned out compressor on a rooftop unit. And it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit up on the roof today. And I need to change out that compressor. So I take all the refrigerant out of the system. I recover it according to the law. I recover all the refrigerant. And then I cut out the old compressor. And the minute I make that cut, the minute I break that tubing on that compressor to take it out of the system, it's in a vacuum. I've pulled into a vacuum to get the refrigerant out. And now air gets sucked into the system. And that air contains moisture. So I get the new compressor up on the roof and I put it in place and I brace it up. And now I've got a system full of air with moisture. And that moisture immediately goes after the oil in my brand new compressor. Oil and water don't mix well, but they have an affinity for each other. So the oil absorbs the moisture out of the air and I need to get it out. So I hook up my vacuum pump and I start to pull a vacuum. And if I pull down to 20,000 microns, where water boils at 72 degrees Fahrenheit, I don't have enough heat in the 70 degree air to get the moisture out of the oil. But if I pull down to 10,000 microns, where water boils at 52 degrees Fahrenheit, there's enough heat in the 70 degree air to boil the water out of the oil. So starting somewhere around 10,000 microns, I'll start to see moisture come out of my air, uh, out of my oil, and that moisture will come out as steam coming out of my vacuum pump. But if I pull down to 500 microns or 250 microns, where water boils between negative 12 and negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit, I will get a much better job of getting the moisture out of my oil because there's heat in that 70 degree air around that new compressor to boil the water out of the oil. So that's why we pull a deep vacuum but it's all based on the pressure temperature relationship. It's based on that saturation point of water at different pressures. That's what we see from this chart.
What we just talked about is that the pressure determines the saturation. Let's look at a little video on that. Saturation is the term used to describe the temperature at which a refrigerant changes state from a liquid to a vapor or vice versa. Saturated refrigerant is a mixture of liquid and vapor, and the saturation point varies with pressure. In refrigerants, there is a direct relationship between pressure and saturation temperature. Thus, as the pressure increases, the saturation temperature increases. And as the pressure decreases, the saturation temperature decreases. Each refrigerant has a different pressure temperature relationship, which can be seen on a graph of pressure temperature curves. Water makes an excellent medium for showing the relationship of pressure and saturation. It's commonly known that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, but this only occurs at sea level with standard atmospheric pressure. When the water in the flask is boiling, it has reached its saturation temperature and any more heat applied will cause it to change state from a liquid to a vapor. The change of state from liquid to vapor occurred at atmospheric pressure and approximately 212 degrees Fahrenheit, the saturation point of water at that pressure. As the vapor in the flask is rapidly cooled with ice, its pressure drops, creating a slight vacuum in the flask. As the pressure in the flask decreases, the saturation temperature also decreases. At the lower pressure, heat already in the water makes it boil once again, but this time at a much lower temperature. Refrigerants are used in the tray to transfer heat, which is accomplished by bringing the refrigerant to the saturation point in order to absorb heat and reject it. The pressure temperature relationship makes this possible. If you decide to try this experiment, make sure to use a shatterproof flask and always wear eye protection. And that brings us to volume. And volume is three dimensional. Volume is the amount of space a material occupies, the amount of space it takes up. And it's determined by pressure and temperature, but we measure it in cubic units, cubic inches, cubic meters, etc. That brings us to what we call the gas laws. And we all know these. We learn these growing up, but we often don't remember them by name. That's okay. But we remember the concept. Boyle's Law, written by Robert Boyle from, from uh, Ireland. Uh, Mr. Boyle noticed something a while ago and wrote it down. He didn't invent it. Mother Nature invented it. Mr. Boyle just noticed it and wrote it down. And what he noticed was this. He noticed an inverse relationship between pressure and volume with a constant temperature. In other words, as the volume increased, the pressure decreased. And as the volume decreased, the pressure increased. That's what Mr. Boyle noticed. And he wrote it down 500 years ago. So every generation since then has taught it to the next generation. I remember learning Boyle's Law as a, as a, as a kid but not from something somebody taught me or told me. It was when I was putting air in my bicycle tire with a hand pump. As I started to put air in my tire, it pumped pretty easy. But the more air I got in there, the harder the pump pushed. Now, I didn't realize at the time that I was experiencing Boyle's Law. But the more air I squeezed into that tire, the higher the pressure went. That's Boyle's Law. It's an inverse relationship between pressure and volume with a constant temperature. Charles' Law, written by Jacques Charles from France, about 100 years after Mr. Boyle, Mr. Charles noticed something and he wrote it down. He noticed a direct relationship between pressure and saturation temperature if the volume stayed the same. So his is a direct relationship as pressure goes up, saturation temperature goes up, where Mr. Boyle's an inverse relationship as volume goes up, pressure goes down. But together, they represent what we call the ideal law of perfect gases or the combined gas law. The combined gas law is a formula that says pressure, volume, and temperature are always related. The way it was written here is pressure times volume divided by temperature will always equal pressure times volume divided by temperature. It's called the ideal law of perfect gases or the ideal gas law or the combined gas law. 
but it's what makes this planet work. This pressure volume temperature relationship determines everything we do. And then we have John Dalton from Great Britain. Mr. Dalton wrote something in the 1800s that he discovered. And what he figured out was this. He figured out that air pressure was actually a sum of the individual pressures of the gases that make up our air. Mr. Dalton was studying medicine and he was trying to figure out if air could transmit disease. And he figured out it can, <laughs> and we know that. But what he found out on the way to figuring out that air can carry germs is that the air pressure was the sum of the pressures of the nine things that make up our air. We're breathing nine things in the air, primarily oxygen and nitrogen. Those are the two big ones. Oxygen and nitrogen make up, on average, 98.9% .9 of what we breathe. Argon's about 1%. So oxygen, nitrogen, and argon typically make up about 99.9% .9 of what we breathe. And the other six things are very, very small by percentage, but they're all there. Hydrogen, helium, ammonia, water vapor, neon, and carbon dioxide. So all together, the pressure of those nine things makes up our atmospheric pressure. That's called Dalton's Law. We use that a lot in psychrometrics when we start to deal with the air uh, being cooled or heated, how much of it is latent heat, how much of it is sensible heat, et cetera. But that's called Dalton's Law. Let's take a look. This demonstration shows what scientists Robert Boyle and Jacques Charles discovered several hundred years ago. Nature's rules of the temperature, pressure, and volume relationships that we commonly take for granted today. Mr. Boyle noticed an inverse relationship between the pressure and the volume of a gas, while Mr. Charles observed a direct relationship between pressure and temperature. As the volume of gas increases, its pressure decreases, as is evidenced when the air is let out of this balloon. The air being released has increased in volume, but the pressure of the air has decreased proportionately. That's called Boyle's Law. With a confined gas, there is a direct relationship between pressure and temperature. If the pressure remains constant, the volume increases as the temperature increases. Or if the volume remains constant, the temperature and pressure increase proportionately as well. Notice how the warmer balloon has increased in size, while the cooler balloon has decreased in size. This is called Charles Law. Working together, aspects of Boyle's Law and Charles Law explain the ideal law of perfect gases, also known as the combined gas law. This law defines the relationship between pressure temperature, and volume. And that is our foundation. So we can build on that now. We have our foundation of Mother Nature's rules, and we can then talk about our equipment that we use to transfer heat. In air conditioning and refrigeration, it's heat transfer from a place we don't want it to a place that makes little or no difference, a place we don't care about. In heating, of course, it's heat transfer by moving the heat from a space where we have it to a place that we want it. But when we transfer heat for air conditioning and refrigeration, we can do it for commercial refrigeration, for industrial process refrigeration, or comfort cooling. It doesn't really matter to us, but there are, of course, different rules from the EPA for each one of these categories. But it's all the same process. It's heat transfer. We have to give the heat a cooler place to go. And that's where our refrigeration cycle comes in. We need a chemical, a refrigerant, that will evaporate to transfer heat and condense to transfer heat. We want it to evaporate at a low pressure and temperature. That happens in the evaporator. It changes from a liquid to a vapor. We want it to condense at a higher temperature and pressure. That happens in the condenser it changes from a vapor back to a liquid. So any chemical we can get to do that can be called a refrigerant, including water. And we use water in absorption refrigeration as a refrigerant, but in compression refrigeration, 
water won't change state from liquid to vapor or vapor to liquid at the pressures and temperatures we need. So we have four main components, the evaporator, where we absorb the heat from the conditioned space, the compressor, where we squeeze the refrigerant and pump it through the system, the condenser, where we re reject the heat to outside the conditioned space, and the metering device that undoes what the compressor did. It takes us from high pressure, high temperature, back to low pressure, low temperature, and starts us back to the evaporator where we start all over again. So if we put those components together, the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, the metering device, it looks like this. Whenever you think of the four main components of an air conditioner or refrigeration system, always start thinking at the evaporator. Always start where the heat transfer starts. It starts at the evaporator. So to help us understand this, what I learned to do years ago was to divide it up. So let's do that. Let's give it a low side and a high side. So if we put a dotted line right through the center horizontally, everything below that dotted line is commonly called the low side. It's low pressure, low temperature, which means everything above the dotted line then is high pressure, high temperature. We commonly call it the low side and the high side. Everything below that dotted line is considered to be inside the conditioned space. And everything above the dotted line then is considered to be outside the conditioned space. Now that's a theoretical line. That red horizontal line is a theoretical line. Actually, for a split system, for example, the line would look like the green line now. The actual line would show us that the compressor and condenser are outside the conditioned space and the metering device and evaporator are inside the conditioned space. So the theoretical line is the red line, but the actual line is the green line. Well, we're talking theory here. So we have the low side and the high side. If we give it another dotted line and give it a left side and a right side, Everything to the left of this new dotted line is the vapor side. Everything to the left is vapor, which means everything to the right then is liquid. So now we have four sides and all systems have four sides. They have the low side, the high side, the vapor side, and the liquid side. More accurately, they have four quadrants or four corners. In the lower right-hand corner, we've got low pressure, low temperature liquid. In the lower left-hand corner, low pressure, low temperature vapor. Upper left corner, high pressure, high temperature vapor. Upper right corner, high pressure, high temperature liquid. So as our refrigerant goes through the system, and in this example, it's going clockwise. You can see the arrows, it's going clockwise here. So as the refrigerant goes through the system, every time it crosses a dotted line, something changes. I call the horizontal dotted line the pressure line, because every time we cross it, we change in pressure. And I call the vertical dotted line the state line, because every time we cross it, we change in state. So every time we cross a dotted line, something happens. It goes like this. We come into the evaporator. Remember, everything starts at the evaporator. We come into the evaporator with a low pressure, low temperature, saturated liquid vapor mixture. We call it liquid, predominantly liquid. Well, it's a low pressure, low temperature, saturated liquid. As it absorbs heat from the conditioned space, the refrigerant changes state from a liquid to a vapor. Once all the liquid is turned to vapor, we can add a little bit of sensible heat to the vapor perhaps, and we call it superheated vapor, but it's still low pressure, low temperature heading into the compressor. So it comes into the evaporator as a low pressure, low temperature, saturated liquid. And if everything's working okay, it comes out of the evaporator as a low pressure, low temperature, superheated vapor. That superheated vapor goes into the compressor. We squeeze it, send it out to the condenser. It's a high pressure, high temperature, superheated vapor now. And at the condenser, we can give up the heat and send it out to the outside space. Now, at that point, the refrigerant cools down, it hits saturation, and then it condenses. And then once it's condensed back to liquid, 
the liquid can cool down. We call it subcooled liquid. So we have saturated vapor, sorry, superheated vapor coming into the condenser, but we have subcooled liquid coming out. Superheated vapor coming into the condenser, subcooled liquid coming out. And that subcooled liquid is still high pressure, high temperature. It goes through the metering device where it drops in pressure, hits its saturation, drops in temperature, and low pressure, low temperature, saturated liquid heads into the evaporator to start all over again. So we pick up heat, we pump it around, and we give up heat. We bring it back, we pick up heat at the evaporator, pump it around, give up heat at the condenser. Liquid to vapor to absorb heat, vapor to liquid to reject heat. Liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid, liquid to vapor, vapor to liquid, over and over and over again, a million times a day. The evaporator absorbs heat by changing the state of the refrigerant from liquid to vapor. And the condenser rejects heat by changing the state of the refrigerant from vapor back to liquid. That's what our systems do. That's the refrigeration cycle. Follow the heat. And it should make sense. But it's latent heat that does most of the work, not the sensible heat. Sensible heat we use to tell what's going on in the system. But latent heat is where we get the work done. Latent heat, liquid to vapor in the evaporator, vapor to liquid in the condenser. That's the refrigeration cycle. Follow the heat. The piping or tubing that holds this all together starts with the suction line coming out of the evaporator going into the compressor. Coming out of the compressor, we discharge the refrigerant to the condenser through what's called the hot gas line by most of us. It should be called the discharge line, but we call it the hot gas line. And the refrigerant leaving the condenser goes back to the metering device through the liquid line. And the liquid line is called that because of what's in it, of course, liquid. So we have the suction line, the hot gas line, and the liquid line. So all systems have four sides and three lines. That little piece of pipe between the metering device and the evaporator, all part of the suction side, doesn't really have its own name anymore. All, start, all part of the suction side. So that is our refrigeration cycle. Refrigeration cycle. The basis for air conditioning and refrigeration systems is the compression refrigeration cycle. And it's always the same, regardless of the size or type of system and the refrigerant used. Always follow the heat as you think of the cycle. Thus, it goes evaporator, compressor, condenser, and metering device in that order, because that's the way the heat moves. To understand the refrigeration cycle, Start by dividing it into two sides, the low side and the high side. Everything below the dotted line is low pressure and low temperature. We call it the low side. That, of course, makes everything above the dotted line high pressure and high temperature. We call it the high side. Everything below the dotted line is, theoretically, inside the conditioned space, and everything above the dotted line is outside the conditioned space. Time for another dotted line. Every system has a vapor side and a liquid side as well. So really, every system has four sides. The low side, the high side, the vapor side, and the liquid side. In reality, every system has four quadrants, or four corners. In this corner, low pressure, low temperature, liquid. In this corner, low pressure, low temperature, vapor. In this corner, high pressure, high temperature, vapor. And in this corner, high pressure, high temperature, liquid. The piping that holds the major components together also has names. As the compressor pulls the refrigerant from the evaporator, it flows through a line we call the suction line. Coming from the compressor, the refrigerant is discharged to the condenser through what should be called the discharge line. But it has two names. System designers may call it the discharge line but technicians usually call it the hot gas line because of what's in it, high temperature vapor, thus hot gas. Once the refrigerant has rejected its heat at the condenser, it turns back to liquid, 
and flows to the metering device through, of course, the liquid line. At the metering device, the liquid refrigerant, still high pressure and high temperature, is given room to expand. The pressure drops, the refrigerant hits its saturation temperature, and goes to the evaporator as low pressure, low temperature, saturated liquid, a liquid vapor mixture to start the process of heat transfer once again. This is the refrigeration cycle, and it's how everything works. Just follow the heat. Heat comes in at the evaporator, where the saturated liquid entering the evaporator absorbs latent heat and changes state from liquid to vapor, and then absorbs sensible heat to become superheated vapor. The low-pressure, low-temperature superheated vapor enters the compressor and becomes high-pressure, high-temperature superheated vapor and is sent to the condenser. The condenser rejects heat from the refrigerant, cooling the superheated vapor, condensing it back to liquid, and then cooling the liquid, what we call subcooling. The subcooled liquid enters the metering device, where by expansion it drops in pressure, hits saturation, and drops in temperature. This saturated liquid, a mixture of liquid and vapor, enters the evaporator. This is the refrigeration cycle, and it's how everything works. Just follow the heat. Refrigeration cycle. It all starts at the evaporator, as we saw before. The air comes across the evaporator. The air gives up some heat to the refrigerant. The refrigerant changes state from a saturated liquid to a superheated vapor. We pull it into the compressor, we squeeze it, send it around to the condenser, where we give up the heat to outside the condition space. So it's pick up heat, pump it around, and give up heat. That's all we do. We pick up heat, we pump it around, we give up heat. That's our refrigeration cycle. Follow the heat to understand how it works. I've done a number of drawings over the years for different customers as I've done my training. And these drawings are available to you if you like them. We'll make sure that you can get them from the Goodhart Wilcox website. We've had that set up in the past, and I'll make sure that they are available to you. So there's a follow the heat drawing for a chiller on the left, different methods of heat rejection for water cooled condensers on the right. Here's a couple for heat pumps, air source and water source heat pumps follow the heat drawings as well. When we talk about heat transfer, think of it like this. What does a domestic refrigerator have in common with a 10,000 ton chiller? What does a heat pump have in common with a refrigerated air dryer? What does a water cooler have in common with a PTAC? Heat transfer. Heat transfer. It's what we do. Everything we do is about heat transfer. We're in the heat transfer business. That's our job. That's why I call it follow the heat. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for sharing your time with us today and your expertise on the follow the heat refrigeration cycle. Um, it's always interesting to learn the process that you use when you're training your students. And hopefully our attendees today will be able to use that information to, to share this with their own students. So thank you again, as always, for representing Goodhart Wilcox as an author. As you mentioned, we'll make sure our attendees can get copies of the great drawings you've put together, as well as samples of the Follow the Heat animation and a copy of Math for HVACR if they haven't seen your book already. So uh, lots of goodies coming your way. Uh, thank you again for all of, all of your time, Gary, and uh, we'll see you again at the next session. Thank you, Kathy.